This is the banana pie. Yeah, I don't know where I was going with this. This is the actual Banana Pi Wi-Fi 6 router and the people behind this project do also make it available on US and SBC, so you can use whichever case you prefer. They did a good job nevertheless and it could easily pass as something developed by Asus or Netgear. But what exactly is a Banana Pi? Besides being a recipe, it's an open source project which is very similar to the Raspberry Pi, so you get a lot of flexibility in terms of the software that can run on the SBC. And it did get more popular during the last couple of years because the Raspberry Pi is very often out of stock and it has gotten more expensive than it was initially. The Banana Pi is also trying to include more powerful chipsets and they're not afraid to get into very competitive markets such as the consumer-based networking hardware. That's how we got the Banana Pi Wi-Fi 6 router in the first place, which comes with a version of OpenWRT already flashed and if you don't trust the developers, you can easily flash your own software. In terms of Wi-Fi centered features, there is no mention of OFDMA support or even the more common MoMIMO and Beamforming, so I checked whether the chipset supports them. I could find the support for WPA3 encryption, both personal and enterprise. The spatial streams configuration is 2x2 on both the 5GHz and the 2.4GHz radio bands, but no mention about OFDMA or beamforming. So yeah, the Wi-Fi C certification is a bit bare bones, but then again the price tag of the router is $30, so I can't really complain that much. Design-wise, the Banana Pi Wi-Fi 6 router looks like a regular wireless router, with some sharp angles here and there. And in terms of antennas, we get four of them, two on the rear and two on the sides. I would have preferred to have them all on the rear side, but I assume the heat from the ports would have an impact on the cables. The antennas cannot be removed, but the joints are similar to other routers, so it's possible to replace them in case they're broken. I did a video which shows how that can be done. The device can be left on the desk since there are 4 feet to keep it in place or, if you don't have the space, you can mount it on the wall using the dedicated mounting holes. As for the LEDs, we get quite a few of them on the front side. It looks like about 15 LEDs. But while the variety is high, each LAN getting its own status LED, as well as the WPS, the radios and the power, the rest don't really serve a purpose. They're there just for aesthetic reasons. Moving on to the ports, from the left we get the power port and the power connector, followed by three LAN ports, all gigabit, same as the one port. For the price tag it would have been interesting to see a 2.5 gigabit port, but it makes sense to not go this route. There is a reset and a WPS button as well, and I noticed that the WPS process enabled itself after startup, which is not really good. Perhaps it's just the LED itself and the WPS process is not enabled. I do need to mention that the developers have included the option to power up PoE devices, as we'll see in the teardown section. As with all other wireless routers and access points that I tested so far, I need to check how well the manufacturers managed to find a way to efficiently move the heat away from the PCB and the chipsets. And to do so I used a thermal camera and I checked how the Banana Pi was doing while I was running some fairly intense tests. This is not in idle mode. And as you can see, we initially don't see anything out of the ordinary, but after turning the router upside down, there are some hotter spots. Will this lead to thermal throttling? I'm fairly sure that it will, because I have already seen some throughput limiting when running some Wi-Fi tests. The developers should have added some aluminum heat spreaders, or maybe the chipsets are not that energy efficient. I'm not sure at the moment. Besides the fact that you can see everything you need on the official Banana Pi Wi-Fi 6 router page, I decided to make a teardown video regardless of that to see if we get what's being promised. And I was pleasantly surprised by the sturdiness of the plastic case and the access to the PCB is quite easy. Just remove the four screws and use the prime tool to detach the upper part. We can see that the four antenna connectors and the PCB which unfortunately lacks any type of heat spreaders. I also need to mention the PoE module, so there is the option to use it to power up PoE devices, but it does need extra hardware. That being said, this is a very quick run through the main components. And I have also included a comparison table at the end. For the single client wireless tests, I used a Wi-Fi 6 client and two Wi-Fi 5 devices, including the Pixel 2 XL that I previously discarded. 
And after being accustomed to seeing near gigabit throughput on other Wi-Fi 6 routers, this is a bit underwhelming, especially when using the 160 MHz channel bandwidth. The interesting thing is that if I ran the iPerf test for a few minutes, I would see an average of 950 megabits per second, but this would not really tell the full story. So to better understand the throughput, we need to have a look at the longer term performance graph. As you can see, everything ran fine for a few minutes, but the Banana Pi Wi-Fi 6 router seems to have a drop to about an average of 600 megabits per second at some point, and it doesn't recover immediately. It happened when using both the 160 and the 80 MHz channel width, and I think it shows that there is some thermal throttling that occurs sometime during the test and it does drop the overall throughput performance. Which is why it's very important to run this test over many, many hours. And unfortunately not many publications do, since it costs money and time and that most don't have. That being said, it's still a very decent performance considering the price tag of the device and there is always room for improvement, obviously. If we have a look at the signal attenuation graphic, we can see that even at minus 83 dB, we're still getting usable throughput, well, only when using the Wi-Fi 6 client device. And this is true both upstream and downstream downstream, as we can see in the following graphics. If I were to compare the Banana Pi to other wireless routers that I tested so far, it does sit at the bottom of the list when using the 160 MHz width, which I suppose makes sense, and that's also true when using the 80 MHz channel bandwidth. It's a cheap device that does its best. Moving on to the 2.4 GHz network, despite setting up the router to use the 40 MHz channel bandwidth, the throughput still only slightly went above 200 Mbps per second. But it's nice to see that it remained fairly strong up until the 70 feet and beyond, which is quite a feat. And as we can see from the graphic, even if the signal attenuation was minus 69 dB, we still get usable throughput on all three client devices. Everything seems to be great, but I do need to mention that the 2.4 GHz radio refused to work at some point and required a router reboot while I was testing it, so there are some occasional stability issues. When compared to other wireless routers, the Banana Pi is actually above some other devices. Ok, so let's now see how the Banana Pi handles multiple client devices running various types of traffic. I use the same devices that I always use and you can also see the signal attenuation that I measured at each client level. I did rely on the same open source tools developed by Mr. Jim Salter which you can get from GitHub, and I started with the simulated 1080p traffic on 5 client devices. As expected, the only client devices that could sit beneath 100 milliseconds for at least 95% of the time are the Wi-Fi 7 and the Wi-Fi 6 clients, while the Wi-Fi 5 clients immediately shut above that limit. I suppose the only reasonable latency can be seen on the two Lenovo laptops, but only for 75% of the time. Let's move forward and run 4K streaming on the 5 clients. I was surprised that 2 clients managed to stay below 100 milliseconds for 95% of the time, but all the rest went above this limit, especially the 2 Wi-Fi 5 client devices, the Zima board reaching 300 milliseconds for at least 5% of the time. At this point, it's best to rely on Ethernet cables. I didn't stop here and I included intense browsing to run alongside 1080p on all 5 client devices. There is an increase in latency, but the Wi-Fi 7 and the Wi-Fi 6 clients did better than expected, up until that last 1%. The intense browsing graphic shows that the aforementioned clients did display a higher latency than the rest, but it's still below the 1.5 seconds limit where most people would just refresh the page. So it should be fine. Now let's run the intense browsing traffic alongside the 4K streaming. And boy, did the two Wi Fi 6 clients struggle to stay below 100 milliseconds. But they only managed to do so for 75% of the time. The rest couldn't bother and went above 100 milliseconds and well beyond for the entire duration of the test. The intense browsing latency does show some 1 second values, but again, anything below 1.5 seconds remains fairly acceptable. Let's move forward and change things a bit. I ran downloaded traffic on two clients where I simulated the continuous download of a 10 MB file. Two clients handled the intense browsing and one the 4K streaming. The intense browsing was handled well as always, but the 4K streaming latency renders it unusable. The downloading clients also displayed latency values well above what can be considered reasonable. The total throughput for the downloading clients was 402 Mbps per second. 
Next, I limited the downloaded traffic to one client, the 4K streaming to a couple of clients, and the intense browsing to the last two. The 4K streaming latency is still too high to be considered reasonable, the intense browsing is handled well, and while the download latency is better than last time, it's still too high. So let's limit the test to only three clients, one for the download traffic, one for the 4K streaming, and the last for the intense browsing. Again, better than before, but it's still not good enough. So let's now download a 1 megabyte file, run intense browsing, and let the last client handle voice over IP. Things got significantly better, as it usually happens at this point. But we're not done because I had to run the downloaded traffic of a 10 megabyte file on all 5 client devices at the same time. And you can only imagine the type of latency I got to see. The only good news, if you can call it like that, is that the banana pie did not drop the connection, while some far more expensive devices did while running this specific test. Now let's talk a bit about the power consumption of the Banana Pi Wi-Fi 6 router. I didn't expect it to be that high, so I used the same old smart relay that I always use. And as you can see from the app, this is what you can expect during normal operation. This is not while I was running the stress tests. As for the software, it's OpenWRT. You can run whatever you want on the SBC, but by default we get an already configured version of OpenWRT, well, up to a certain point. We do need to create an admin account and the Wi-Fi networks are open, so that needs to change. And the developers included a whole lot of SSIDs to choose from. You can delete all of them and create your own or just edit the existing ones. I do need to mention that at some point the router decided that the Wi-Fi networks no longer needed a security key, so that was not good. You do need to check if things are in order from time to time. I checked the software section and it doesn't seem that there is anything added above the standard packages, so you can add your own, although do be aware of the RAM and the CPU limitations. Something like Snort will not run properly. Adblock and Adguard Home will work fine though. There isn't much else to say, if you're familiar with OpenWRT then you should feel at home, otherwise know that it's a bit less friendly than some of the OAM software you get out there, such as from Asus, TP-Link or Netgear. But it's easy to understand what's going on and start configuring things the way you want them to work without much limitations. I'm always excited by open source projects and the Banana Pi is definitely a step in the right direction considering all the subscriptions and the cloud limitations as well as the data collection. And yes, the $30 will definitely turn a lot of heads, but understand that there are some obvious limitations both in processing power and in the Wi-Fi performance that you get to experience. You can see it from my test that it did ok considering its expected shortcomings. And of course there are quite a few of them, including some occasional bugs, so it's not the perfect device by any means. That's all for now, thank you for watching, and see you next time.